who has the honour and the privilege of giving this inaugural lecture here, even deeper in the southern hemisphere than my own homeland, and now, 125 years after the founding of your university and its law faculty, provide occasion and stimulus to reflect with you on an important question that confronts us all, and on the answer to it given by those who, in 1888, committed themselves to that venture of foundation. The question arises for each of us when we consider the enormous profusion of more or less scholarly materials that offer to convey to us, hand over, hand down to us, the accumulations of information or purported information, and the methods and results, or purported results, of investigation and reflection, and the traditions of discourse in numerous fields of inquiry. The question equally arises when we have chosen a field of inquiry and learning, and then within that one field of discipline confront not only the profusion of competing schools of thought or philosophies, but also the thousands of books and printed articles and internet resources available to transmit to us their authors' ideas <coughs> and beliefs. In all of this profusion, the question is, who and what shall I trust? This predicament is created for us by, in large measure, the accumulations of traditions. <coughs> what are traditions? They are creations of human thought, imagination, and action, which persist or recur by being transmitted from person to person eventually across succeeding generations of persons. Theoretical reflections on law have, for a century, been influenced by Max Weber's type distinctions between the charismatic, the traditional, and the rational in human affairs, especially in human exercises of authority and government, and by his association of the legal with the rational. But any such contrast between traditional and rational must be qualified. Certainly an unquestioning adherence to traditions that are themselves closed to questions does indeed contrast with rationality. But as the book Tradition by Weber's Anglophone successor Edward Schills emphasizes, the rational activities of science are reliant upon traditions. Without the handing down and transmission that are the essence of tradition, neither the scientific method of the natural sciences nor their huge accumulation of true results could be known conveyed as information to those who can make use of it, whether in further pure science or in technologies, useful works and products of every kind for the endeavor. Scholarly exploration of these aspects of tradition, of these traditions <coughs> at the heart of legitimate science, is in fact a recent and valuable tradition in the philosophy of science. It would be interesting and I think fruitful to pursue Schultz's reflections on the role, the merits, and the dangers of tradition and traditions, and on the need for traditions in many domains of human existence. But today, I wish instead to reflect with you on something related, but quite distinct and more important, the tradition. What I have called in my title, The Tradition of Reason and Justice. In taking this as my topic, I can honour, and perhaps shed some light on, the decision of your founders to found not just a university, but a Catholic 
universe. And I can say something about the metaphysical, ontological foundations of the law and of the moral truths on which any acceptable law is found. The tradition is unique by the traditions. It is not only, not only is it explicitly conscious of its own status and content as at once both tradition and reason, it also is concerned to demonstrate and retain its full critical reasonableness. In the paper in Cyclical Fides et Ratio, in 1998, this was called the great tradition which, beginning with the ancients, passes through the fathers of the church and the masters of scholasticism and includes the fundamental achievements of modern and contemporary thought. The encyclical added, some philosophers are promoting a recovery of the determining role of this tradition for a right approach to knowledge. The appeal to tradition is not a mere remembrance of the past, it involves rather the, the recognition of a cultural heritage which belongs to all of humanity. That observation, like the whole encyclical, repays our study, but it leaves room also for a fuller, sharper depiction of the contours and content of this central tradition. The tradition which with acute awareness that there are alternative traditions, understands itself as valid for all human persons, whether they have heard of it or not. And I will make this outline of the tradition without presupposing the principles of doctrine and theology. An encyclical, on the other hand, is an act of handing on that strand of the tradition which we may call the tradition of truth. It presupposes those doctrinal principles. It does so, of course, on the meta or second order presupposition, that presupposing those doctrinal principles, treating them as principles, as principia, starting points, is fully reasonable. That meta or second order presupposition is what I shall be addressing as an essential element in answering the question why and how there is a tradition that deserves to be called the tradition, the tradition of reason, and therefore also of faith and justice. Let us listen again to section 85 of Fides and Rats. The great tradition, beginning with the ancients, passes through the fathers of the church and the masters of scholasticism and includes the fundamental achievements of modern and contemporary thought. Well, who are these ancients? It would be easy to assume that they are the Greek philosophers, mathematicians, natural scientists, and historians of the 5th, 4th, and later centuries before Christ, outstanding thinkers of whose work the church fathers and scholastics, not to mention the Roman lawyers, both pagan and Christian, made ample use. That is the assumption on which modern educational, curricular, and encyclopedias of philosophy, science, and culture are largely shaped, shaped and based. We should, however, directly challenge this widespread assumption that the roots of the tradition are Greek. The metaphysical and moral theses consistently affirmed by the prophets of Israel, and thus by the Old Testament, that library whose whole literary construction is shaped by these prophets' teaching, are theses fundamental to the great tradition. They include theses that are both radically superior to the corresponding positions of even the best Greek philosophers, and fundamental to those elements of today's thought which can and should be defended, explored, deployed, and handed on. What are these superior, sounder pieces? I should say something about four under the labels creation, freedom, justice and humanity, and faith as intelligent and rational acceptance of divine revelation. 
Each of the four theses, and there are of course others, constituted a rupture from the past and from the whole surrounding matrix of civilizations and cultures. Each of these theses would later be taken up and rendered into more reflexively philosophical form. This was done by thinkers who had developed and deepened those new Jewish insights in and after they became Christians. Christian thinkers who soon understood how the established Greek philosophical tradition with its schools and sects could and should be transformed and radically improved by those same Jewish insights. The four theses are directly, or in the case of the fourth, indirectly fundamental to sorry, the rule of law. The next state of law, as we know. And they are therefore fundamental to the philosophy of law. I should today say something about the historical emergence of these as tradition. I am not suggesting that their truth, warrant, or defensibility depends upon the circumstances of their original discovery and articulation. It does not. Though in the case of the thesis about faith, the rationally warranted truth about it directs us towards certain origins, reasonably called historical events of revelation. In my teaching and writings, I have sought, in largely secular and philosophical contexts, to expound, defend, and show some implications of all these truths, doing so without much reference to the history and shape of the tradition. Today, however, I shall make reference to these deep shaping theses of the tradition and to their original articulation. <laughs> Four, a society's laws and its juridical and doctrinal understandings of law and of its own laws are a kind of crystallization of the understandings and misunderstandings widespread in that society about reality in its deepest aspects, and about human goods and the principles of right and wrong choosing. And both the works of my own teacher and former colleague H. L. A. Hart, penetratingly analyzed in the important monograph of Professor Orego, and the works of my former long-time colleague, Ronald Walkin, indicate sufficiently, though discreetly, that the thoughts of each of those about law, different <coughs> thoughts, of course, and about particular laws, doctrines, and projects of law reform, were thoughts profoundly shaped by beliefs and attitudes about these four theses, all four of them and about the entire tradition that has conveyed those theories and theses right to us. Neither Hart nor Walken expounded those underlying beliefs and attitudes of theirs in their teaching or public writings, except perhaps in the case of Walken in his very last year or so of life. But they were of decisive importance, I believe, for that teaching and writing. And the theses at stake are indeed truths that none of us can afford to take merely for granted. They are truths which it is the special responsibility of a Catholic university to appropriate and reaffirm, <coughs> and which it is the merit of Catholic universities, when they fulfill that responsibility, to defend and deepen, even or especially, in a counter-cultural way. At the end of this address, I shall say a little more about the circumstances in which that task must be undertaken today and in the coming years. So I turn to the first piece, creation. The idea of creation is now so central to the great tradition that it seems common sense, even to those of our contemporaries who reject it. Listen to Charles Darwin as he speaks in his autobiography in 1876, 17 years after The Origin of Species, 
speaks of the extreme difficulty, or rather impossibility, of conceiving this immense and wonderful universe, including man with his capacity of looking far backwards and far into futurity, of conceiving this as the result of blind chance or necessity. When thus reflecting, I feel compelled to look to a first cause, having an intelligent mind, in some degree analogous to that of man. Well, such clarity, reason warrants the rational judgment that everything in the immense and wonderful universe has a first cause, implicitly no part of, but entirely transcending that universe, of which it is the first cause by activity of its intelligent mind, such clarity already surpasses in its result the best in Plato's or Aristotle's philosophizing about the divine causality <coughs> at work in the world. When articulated more explicitly than this terse remark by Darwin, the thesis clearly involves the denial that there is any divine being or beings within the universe. It involves the radical distinguishing of the entirety of nature from the divine nature. The dehumanizing of nature and at the same time it's de-absolutizing. Revealing natures, universes, <coughs> thoroughgoing contingency and its utter lack of any elements that might explain, account for its existence as a totality of intelligible beings and interactions. This is the metaphysical reasoning and judgment articulated as a matter of common sense, our common sense, handed down eventually to us, as to Darwin, from Genesis chapter 1. From Psalm 19, the heavens declare the glory of God, and from the precision attributed to the mother of the mountain seven brothers in the second book of Maccabees, chapter 7, when you see the heavens, the earth, and all that is in it, you know that God made all this from nothing. And again, from the masterly summation of the Hebrew creation tradition in Rabbi Saul's letter, as Paul, to the Romans, God's invisible attributes, his everlasting power and divinity, are made visible to reason by means of his works since the creation of the world. This new thesis in the tradition liberated and motivated human thought for unrestricted inquiry into the intelligibilities of the entire natural world. That practical meaning of the thesis can be discerned in Aquinas' critique of certain monotheistic believers in creation and providence, who, as Muslim professors would declare them, held that the power of the divine designer works its effects independently of natural causalities, which are thus more apparent than real. St. Thomas's response to this is a reply also to those who imagine that the designer rationally envisaged by the psalmist, by St. Paul and Darwin, initiated everything merely by one tremendous initial creation of natural potentialities which since then have been merely left to their own operations and independent working <coughs> of their initial potentialities. No, says Aquinas to both sides, no. In his consideration of divine problems, what we think of as effects of natural causes are indeed precisely that effects of natural causes in chains or sequences of causation which can fruitfully be investigated by natural sciences. And at the same time, all these natural effects and causes are being caused here and now as much as at the beginning of time by the power of the intelligent designer. They are effects wholly of their natural causes and wholly of the transcendent, beyond nature, cause that explains both the creation of nature from nothing and all the workings of nature ever since. And reflection on this holy 
holy of St. Thomas, on the thing or event in question being not partly attributable to nature and partly to divine power, but rather in whole to natural causes and in whole to God. This orients us to the true meaning of the word transcendent. This elegant solution of opposing problematic positions is a permanent acquisition of human wisdom, securing the place and integrity of the natural sciences. We need only add two things. One, insofar as modern science, not least in macroevolutionary biology, in which Darwin's role was strategic, discloses the emergence from time to time of genuinely new species, new kinds of organisms, and organs and forms of life. To that extent, the Thomas distinction between creation and providence may appropriately be softened to allow that providence includes an ongoing, if not continuous, creation. And second, any such ongoing creation is doubtless by way of what we all easily call, since at latest Crick and Watson's 1953 discovery of the structure of reading of DNA, we easily call new information. For today, by a remarkable unintended but real analogy with Aristotelian accounts of form, we understand the workings of organic life as workings directed at the micro level by a series of intra and intermolecular realities and relationships that natural scientists concur in finding most adequately describable in terms of information, messages and messengers, expressions, programs, sense and nonsense, transcription, reading, translation, copying, and so forth as aspects of the working of a code with four or five letters, the four nucleotide bases in DNA, the slightly different set of four bases in RNA, the amino acid without which DNA cannot perform its essential functions. Of course, all these terms, information, code, program, messengers, and so forth, are being used by analogy with their folk or central case usage in relation to our activities as intelligent beings communicating with each other in relation to our, uh, in, by intentional acts of meaning. So I should call the information described in modern natural sciences analogous information, as distinct from the central case information conveyed by, for example, the scientists themselves in conversations, reports, articles, and other communications with each other. Among the empirical realities that persuade scientists of the need to use this analogy is the capacity of organisms to repair themselves when damaged and to work around and respond ingeniously and even proactively to lesions, insults, diseases, and threats to their immunity in ways impossible for machines however complex of the pre-information technology era and imitated only partially and clumsily by the IT machines of today. Our conversations and books and lectures are utterly different from the chance selection of letters by an army of monkeys pressing computer keyboards or two simple Morse code transmitters. No matter. So too, the operations of nature these operations deploy, like a vast symphonic or operatic composition, atomic, physical and chemical, molecular, chemical, biochemical, biological, and organic operations, largely if not wholly describable, commonly described as involving transmission and utilization of information. They are operations as far removed from mere chance or randomness as they are from the purposes or causality of cosmic stellar divinities such as Plato and Aristotle, differing ways, supposed are at work within and from within our universe. And our empirical modern natural science makes a radical breach or rupture with the idea of psychical operations of an eternal cosmos, the idea dreamed of by Greek popular religion 
and postulated by sophisticated pre-Socratic atheistic atomists. Instead, our empirical science, as distinct from the philosophizing of some scientists, tells us with abundant evidence of a universe of the definite <coughs> beginning. And beyond this, the empirical evidence leaves us to infer nothing, and neither time nor space. It tells us with abundant evidence that this universe is evolving from the evidently less information rich to the increasingly amply information rich. This evolution has had such a manifest directionality, including the directionality of acceleration in increase of analogous information, that after less than 14 billion years, it saw the emergence of the stable species we call human beings. We and our human forebears are animals so remarkably evolved, whether gradually in, in the decisive stages or not, and whether in the chance dominated ways proposed by neo Darwinist empirical hypotheses or not, that our brains and, our, and their processes can support the spiritual operations of intentional reflection on, communication of, abstract, reflexive <coughs> meanings. They can likewise support the insights needed to understand, to choose to investigate these evolved forms of life and being, and the whole history of these forms of life, and something of their more or less probable future. There was thus a change in the structure of reality so transformative that it could be called a kind of rupture with the past of evolution of nature and life. All along, the transcendent mind, will, and power has been causing, progressively as well as initially, the existence and content of that vast and expanding, evolving accumulation and transmission of analogous information which we call nature. With the emergence of man and of human intelligence, will, and free action, the universe is at last in a position such that the transcendent creator can now bring into effect the choice to cause also a transmission of central case information to members of this newly emerged species of the humankind mind, and speak to mind, now spirit, commune with spirit. And beyond bare possibilities, there are historical facts. The Jewish people's accomplishment in reaching their settled and superior understanding of the universe's origins and natural intelligibility, centuries earlier than Greeks reached their own standard and inferior understanding, seems to have been, in fact, an accomplishment both of natural reason, intelligence, reflecting on experienced realities, and of the receptivity of that people's prophets and priests to divine communication in any of the modes they came to call revelation. It was reflected and articulated with remarkable consistency and coherence throughout the body of developing and temporarily, temporarily stratified traditions and writings that we call the Old Testament. As I said earlier, this accomplishment or acquisition is a central element of the great tradition that has so shaped our common sense that no one can now take seriously the pagan conception of a partly divinized world. And those who spurn the creation pieces in favor or defense of their own atheism or pantheism cannot conceal their truncation of rational inquiry, their bukas against some legitimate questions about the explanation of the existence and intelligibility <coughs> of what we empirically experience and scientifically infer. In modern times, those who thus declare a proper field of further inquiry out of bounds, or who tacitly ignore it, often do so on the basis of an honestly and vividly felt consideration, the argument from evil. That is the argument which persuaded Darwin, 
to set aside his own reasonable reflective inference from natural order to intelligent creation. But appealing though it can be to sentiment, it was the argument from evil was it is a mistake. It mistakenly presumes that divine causality is of a kind that could be assessed by the standards we apply to natural causality or to the causality whereby conclusions are explained by their premises, or to the causality whereby human actions are explained by their authors' choices and objectives, or human crafts are explained by their objectives. The standards we apply in those domains to assess something effective, monstrous, wrong, evil, or fake. That God's causality is transcendent details that the argument from evil against divine existence and creative providence fails. It fails not because it entails that the evils pointed to are only apparent, but because on the standards appropriate to and known now only to the creative wisdom, wisdom capable of conceiving and bringing about from nothing the ever more astounding intelligibilities of nature, the universe in which evils, or what by other standards are evils, are to be found, along with all that is intelligible to us as really good, may nonetheless be something very good, and in important respects, better, more intelligently selected by its creator than a universe without those evils. The Old Testament's consistent understanding of creation and providence invites the philosophical developments and defenses that Christian thinkers subsequently provided for it and that are a central treasure in the patrimony that we call the tradition. Well, the tradition has a second main component, a component contributed to it more vividly and fully by the Hebrew people than by the Greek. The thesis that we really can time to time do, make free choices. We have free will. Here again, it is not a matter simply of proof texts in which the Old Testament articulates this freedom, though such texts can easily be found, but also a matter of the whole narrative of personal and communal responsibility for choices, the choices made of covenants freely entered into and broken and restored by renewed undertakings. St. Thomas was not adding a simply New Testament teaching or philosophical thesis to Genesis meaning when he said that man's being made in the image of God is a matter of man's having the freedom of choice, mastery over his or her own acts. Like the church fathers from Justin Martyr and Irenaeus in the second and third centuries to John Damascene in the eighth, Aquinas teaches the radical freedom of the will its capacity to prefer one option to an alternative, such that nothing, either outside or inside one's makeup, explains one's preference, save that act itself of choosing, preferring. For reasons one might call pedagogical, Aquinas minimizes, to the point of tacitly conceiving, the extent to which this thesis is marks the transformation of the structures of Aristotle, whose subtle and strenuous account of decision making never affirms real and true freedom, but only a kind of freedom from external constraints. In this way, as in some others, the genius of Aquinas' synthesis of the great tradition obscures from our view the extent to which the tradition's Christian form has broken from Athens and preferred Jerusalem, while bringing over from Athens everything that helps articulate Jerusalem's own wisdom as not only revealed, but also in many of its elements accessible to natural reason. Here I shall offer just two summary sets of observations about the truth that, though not everything we do is freely chosen, we can make choices that are free in the strong, far-reaching sense of us to find. Well, just as God's causality 
though absolutely necessary to explain the existence and the astounding intelligibility and non randomness of nature, is so transcendent that it can and should be said to be wholly the cause of natural events, which are wholly the effects of natural causes. So too, God's causality must be the cause of acts of human free choice, acts that truly have no cause other than their making by the human person who makes them. And secondly, to speak of human free choices is also to speak of deliberations about the merits and demerits of the alternative options between which one must choose. And thus it is also to speak of conscience, as one is intelligent reflecting on those merits, whether they have been in advance, generally in abstraction from particular circumstances, or concretely in particular circumstances, or reflecting retrospectively on what one could and should or should not have chosen. The sense of personal responsibility for one's own character and the reality of conscience are also realities known more clearly in the Jerusalem of the Old Testament brought to its full development in the New than in the Athens of the philosophy. This clarity about freedom and responsibility is new in human history and is a permanent pillar of the tradition. The clarity is itself an aspect and result of the proclamations and teachings of the remarkable thinkers before the prophets of Israel, the Nabi, as they understood themselves to be the spokesmen of God, especially their teachings about justice. Thomas Aquinas begins his big treatise on justice by adopting the definition of justice promoted by Justin in his digest. There, in that ambitious work of digest of discreetly integrating Roman law into the now fairly firmly Christian tradition, the definition appears near the beginning of Book One with an attribution to Alpin, perhaps the most influential of Roman jurists. Justicia is constant in perpetua voluntas, just so quickly to wear. Justice is the firm and lasting willingness to give to each his rights. And the precepts of right, Juris Praecta, are to live honestly, to do no harm to others, and to give to each what he is entitled to. So quickly to wear. Modern Roman law scholars like my Oxford colleague Tony Honore are confident that this definition cannot rightly be ascribed to the great Vulcan, and they tend more to treat it as a mere humdrum endorsement of existing law and existing positive legal rights. Of course, in Aquinas, the definition is much richer in significance and is open to the widest horizons of human entitlement to respect. And honore scholar himself accepts that the definition's unknown author is linked with the circle of that notable Christian intellectual origin. Honoré argues from other passages more authentically attributed to Alpin that he, Alpin, was the pioneer of human rights, that is, of justice and equity for all. <coughs> and to explain Alpin's insights, he cautiously points not only to Stoicism, and to the cosmopolitan and egalitarian policies of the late Antonine emperors around the turn of the second third century AD, but also to the possibility that Alpine was exposed to Christians through courtly circles, and the will and welcome the universalism and care for the weak that marked Christianity. No need to speculate further here. What is certain is that the Jewish people, through their prophets from Moses and the prophets, the priestly practice of legislation inspired by them manifested a far-reaching and novel understanding of the requirements of justice centuries earlier than Greece and its great philosophers. Read Exodus 21 to 23, Leviticus 19, 25, and Amos and other prophets on the duties owed by all to the poor, to widows, to newborn children, orphans, strangers, servants. And read amongst much else, Deuteronomy 4's reflection that the precepts of the law are themselves just, a matter of intelligence and wisdom. The far-reaching prophetic insistence on the duties of justice as implications of the rejection of idolatry, that is, as implications of recognizing the transcendence of the one prominent creator, 
This insistence is, that it is insistently developed somewhat further by the convert Rabbi Saul in his letter to the Romans as a confirmation of that same recognition of the divine nature from God's works from the creation of the world. To shut one's eyes to these works, to refuse to acknowledge, glorify, and thank the Creator is, says the Epistle, such a failure of reason that passions take reason's direct place, resulting not only in orientation to and practice of obscene perversions, but also in injustices of the many personal kinds that support their lists in Romans 1, 29 to 31. For the injustices identified and excluded from conscientious deliberation by the Ten Commandments not only are identified in the revelation of God's will to Israel, but equally are in principle identifiable to, accessible to, the natural reason and conscience of anyone anywhere who is open to serving truth and justice. Romans 2, 8 through 15. The humanism of the prophets, who conceived Paul, was, at least in its emphasis, notably more political than Paul's. The Hebrew prophet's humanism was more centered on the misdeeds, the chastisement, and the redemption of a whole people led astray in the first instance, but not only, by the misdeeds of their political leaders. It was and is a humanism focused, as I have said, on the humanity of the exploited, of the vulnerable, despised. The humanism of a call for justice to each and all. It presupposes even that all are lovable, and at least as neighbours or companions, <coughs> to be loved as for <coughs> oneself. <coughs> but in many of those whom we call the prophets, such as Amos, Hosea, Isaiah himself, and Micah, there is a further humanism and universality, namely the expectation or prophecy that eventually all nations will go up to Jerusalem to be taught by God his ways and walk in his justice, their disputes settled by him, so that the nations will live in peace with each other, each retaining its identity, its own religion perhaps distinct from Israel, while God restores to dignity and a proper place all to lame and banished individuals. Michael 4, expanding on Isaiah 2. The information conveyed in what we call the New Testament about the unambiguously everlasting significance and destiny of each individual human person, one by one, completed and deepened the prophet's message of responsibility for justice. The thesis becomes practice, and it's important, it's complete, it's in God. We are to live lives fully respectful of the human goods each of us has been given as seed and talents. My colleague Tony Honore, whose scholarly monograph on Alki and I have just drawn upon, was a close collaborator and co-author with my doctoral supervisor, H.L.A. Hart. In the chair of the of Prudence in Oxford, Hart was succeeded in 1969 by Ronald Walken, who in turn was succeeded in 2000 by John Gardner, who this year published a book of essays on law in general, entitled Law as a Leap of Faith. Let me dwell a little not on the book, nor today on law in general, but on the phrase leap of faith. In many minds, non Christian and Christian, even Catholic, the words leap and faith go together. Between faith and reason, or indeed reasons, there is no bridge, so one must leap if one chooses to, or stay with reason if one chooses not to leap. Although that is certainly not the teaching of John Paul's and Second Paul Fides at Grazio, I do not think the issue is fully confronted or clarified in that encyclical, partly because the document does not, so far as I can see, take time to clarify what the revealing is that constitutes as divine revelation, the precise object of true faith. Indeed, while the encyclical cites various important teachings of the First Vatican Council about faith and revelation, it omits to cite that council's teaching that faith is probably in no way a leap in the dark, and that the Catholic faith is reasonable and tested by many objective signs, making clear that its content is indeed revealed to us by the Creator 
signs such as prophecies and miracles, most importantly, words and actions of Jesus of Nazareth. For having faith, as that council conceives it, is a matter of believing in the truth of propositions held out to us for a fully reasonable judgment, a judgment whereby one accepts them as true because of the veracity of God on whose authority the propositions have been affirmed by the various witnesses to the faith, some of them prophets divinely inspired, some of them writers divinely preserved from a certain era, some of them witnesses to Jesus the Christ, some of them the teachers of the community he found. Though expressed in the philosophical language of Aquinas and the idiom of the 19th century, all this conciliatory thinking is, of course, no more than making articulate what is partly articulated and certainly manifested in that teaching of the Hebrew prophets which finds its completion in Jesus and his especially articulate witnesses, John, Peter, Paul, and the author of the letter to the Hebrews. By faith, these men did not mean merely some sort of chosen commitment or stance or attitude or dedication to forms of worship and speech about our God, they meant an objective certitude about the truth, the truths, true propositions, that God is the creator and is transcendent master of creation and of its history and loves and wills the good individually of the only creatures who like him can choose and if they will can bring about good refuse to intend evil, and that he, God, communicates those of his purposes that he chooses to communicate, reveal, to chosen men and women among his chosen and thereby informed people. Let that be the fourth of the four theses. It points to truths, some of which are known only by revelation, and in that sense are known by the circumstances of their origin, but the truths of faith include also many important truths that are accessible also, the very same truths, to reason independently of revelation. Notably, the other three theses, and indeed all the truths of a sound morality. Like creation itself, with its hitherto ever increasing and indeed accelerating complexity of development directing information, the prophetic tradition from Abraham in the 19th century before Christ, Moses in the 12th, Amos and Isaiah and others in the 8th, and so on down to Daniel in the 2nd and 1st, was a tradition of extraordinary complexity. And this richness includes elements that, when they become isolated from the dynamic master directive idea, result in monsters, cancers, and many other kinds of illness. The prophetic visions of a non psychic history proceeding with definite direction towards messianic transformation of this world have by side effect contributed down to today to severe illnesses of the social, the ecclesiastical and the political order through myths of revolutionary transformation, third ages, inevitable progress and the like. But at its heart, the tradition of the prophets in Israel was a tradition of love of and submission to nothing but truth. By its rational clarity and truthfulness about fundamental features of reality, it contributed greatly to the tradition we know. At the historic climax of Israel's prophetic tradition, in Jesus, and in John the Evangelist, Peter and Paul, and the other witnesses to Christ, the prophetic sequence was inserted into a lasting context and frame, more deeply informed about history's direction and more capable of containing the prophetic richness in a dynamically stable order and directly idea, the church. That is not simply this bearer of information, but is also and primarily the new Israel and new Jerusalem. Indeed, is the beginning of a new creation above all and for human persons, a society with God that will not be completed within this world and its history. The Hebrew prophet's critique of idols and polytheism and the human sacrifice and human castes of every kind was a rational, even rationalist <coughs> critique. 
God's speaking to these prophets by inspiration and the supernatural influence of the church of grace was not when its manifestations are taken as a whole, an eruption imposing itself on passive and unprepared minds. Rather, it was more in the nature of a dialogue in which the divine voice speaks to a questioning intelligence. Just as, as St. Paul saw, denial of creation both promoted and was promoted by immersion in moral corruption, so the intelligence and rational good judgment of the prophets was healed from distraction, evasion, and the lies of self-perception and immoral cultures. And thus purified and sanctified, was able to receive intimations of the divine nature and purpose. True, those intimations, both in the manner in which they were conveyed and received and in their content, went beyond what natural reason, reasoning from insights into experience is able and its own resources to affirm. But the insights articulated as these intimations were insights fulfilling and perfecting not having a rupture with intelligence and intelligent inquiry. The first generations of Christians, like John in his Gospel of Prologue, and like St. Paul in his Christ of the Athenians, and his letters from God to Romans, saw in the Duke of Christ the opportunity of completing the prophetic traditions, openness to the Greek traditions of dialectical inquiry that we call philosophical. I have been speaking about that openness <coughs> in this grave cycle, insisting that it is far more than an openness, rather it is an appropriation, by way of which eventually the now completed prophetic tradition of Israel was in a position to transform the foundational results of Plato's and Aristotle's reflective investigations, rejecting some fundamentals of their worldview while appropriating the sound parts of their dialectical methods and philosophical vocabulary, words crystallizing insights. For the truths of creation, freedom, and true justice and honesty of life are indeed transformations. From a, from a perspective of the main hostile to the first thesis, we call also to the other three, say the perspective of Celsus in the late second century, or of Fichte, or Kant, or Marx, and Nietzsche, and not to mention countless other metaphysicians in the 19th century. The appropriation of these species by the Christian continuation of the Hebrew tradition seemed to them more a rupture with reason than a continuation or even transformation of the Hellenistic intellectual tradition of philosophy. But what is rupture, or rather is transformation and continuity, is to be judged only from the perspective of that tradition which most adequately understands and articulates the truth about the issues in question, the tradition that is judged truly. <coughs> How does one determine what tradition that is? Which one? It must be a tradition that teaches without reservation or equivocation that there is truth and error in relation to nature and logic and forms of choice and action, and teaches that truth is to be earnestly sought and all error conscientiously avoided. It must accordingly be a tradition that establishes institutions like this one here, in which, in a world of ever-increasing complexity and information, truth can be patiently winnowed from error, and the winnowing and its fruits passed on as both methods and results to new generations. It must be a tradition that has an adequate account of rival traditions and of the points at which they remained ignorant of or failed to understand or refused to accept the truths central to the central tradition. No tradition can be accepted which fails to acknowledge the truths of creation, freedom, and moral responsibility for justice. And if a tradition is to be recognized as the tradition, it must be a tradition into which there is a way, into which there is a way, a way lying open to natural reason on the basis of experience in the broad sense of experience that includes rationally warranted acceptance of credible human testimony. 
For as Aquinas, one of the supreme exponents of the tradition, states and repeats, the truths that we call truths of the faith are such that they can and should be defended and expounded not only to people who assume the truth of the books of the Old Testament, or only to people who assume the truths of the New Testament, but also to people who do not assume or accept the truth of either, but who are open to being persuaded to accept that truth, persuaded simply from a starting point in natural reason. This natural reason is informed by experience of life in family and society, and can be enhanced by learning, mathematics, and the natural sciences of history, and on the basis of all these, by the highly reflexive natural reason that we call philosophy. The gospel must be acceptable as true, not only to those who have had little of such learning, but also to those who have much. And it is. Parts of it are both knowable directly by natural reason and affirmed in the sources of divine revelation. The other parts of it are not accessible directly by natural reason, but only by way of those sources of divine revelation, sources which, however, can and should be judged credible by the criteria of careful, open-minded natural reason. Those criteria of credibility include the coherence and cumulative richness of the content of what is proposed as revealed, and by its openness to the advances of the knowledge accessible directly to natural reason. To repeat, a tradition cannot be worthy of one's choice to commit one's trust to it if it asserts or intimates that we have no freedom to choose and therefore no moral responsibility in acting or declining to act, and in thinking honestly and reasonably, rather than by wish fulfillment and self-deception. A tradition cannot be worthy of trust if it denies <coughs> that knowledge of truth is really, truly a good, an error and illusion or delusion really and evil to be fled from. Nor can it be worthy of trust if it denies or ignores the truth that because this and the other basic human goods are good for other persons as they are for oneself, one has responsibilities of justice out of rational love and respect for that good, those goods, in others as in oneself. Responsibilities to everyone, though not equal to everyone alike. I've been articulating a rational judgment that the prophets of Israel and the theologians of Judah who elaborated their insights in narratives and psalms and other works of what we call the Old Testament were neither deluded nor deceptive when they judged themselves to be conveyors of information from God. The judgment I have articulated is one made by considering their insights, affirmations and works as a whole. When so considered, the rational clarity and soundness of their teaching, <coughs> superior in soundness on fundamentals to even the best of the Greek philosophers, along with its constancy and coherence across many centuries and many prophets, and its iteration and reiteration in the face of bitter opposition from the surrounding culture and cultures, are important among the features that make it a judgment that is both responsible and reasonable. The reliability of that judgment, in turn, enhances and is strongly enhanced by the still more momentous judgment that Jesus of Nazareth, in one aspect of his reality, the greatest of all prophets, neither deludes nor was deluded when he affirmed his divine authority to disclose and enact the salvific information that both announces and opens the way into the new form of creation called the kingdom of the God. The value of his deeds as warranting his words should be assessed with due attention to, amongst other things, creation for all, for all miracles, the establishment and sustaining of nature by creation ex nihilo is somehow the most wondrous, astonishing in its disclosure of divine capacity for utter mastery and purposefulness. Such power and purpose not only made indubitably feasible Christ's signs and miracles, 
but equally can make feasible the unimaginable transformation of nature in the new creation promised for the race of bodily creatures which God made also intelligent and spiritual. Since the close of the apostolic age, the information in Revelation is handed down, parted to it, transmitted in the two forms of tradition known as Holy Scripture and now and narrative tradition. These are mutually interrelated in the way lucidly enough expressed in the Second Vatican Council's dogmatic constitution of the Revelation, Verbum. They develop through the centuries in the form of those expositions, clarifications, disambiguations, and leaking and appropriation of scripture and tradition as a whole, expositions that we call doctrine, when they are made authoritatively by the church, founded by Jesus. The propositional content of all this and its rational defensibility is clarified by sound philosophy, assisting sound theology. Theology, which takes as its principles and pillars the doctrines of the Church founded by Christ to initiate and build up the kingdom, the new creation. Both the interpretation of scripture and the formulation and interpretation of doctrine proceed by a method similar to the methods proper for assessing, antecedently to theology as such, the credibility of revelation, that is, of considering, so far as possible, the whole. This is a matter of assessing each part in the light so far as possible of all the other parts, while recognizing the greater significance for the assessment of those parts that both enable the other parts to take on their full sense, coherent with the others, and most securely warrant the truth of the whole. And I'm referring, of course, to the greater significance of the words and the deeds of Jesus of Nazareth, as described in Gospels, justifiably understood as intending to tell the truth about him and his words and deeds, as they actually took place in the history of Galilee, Samaria, and Judea between 27 and 30 AD. And all this assessing can count as part of, indeed central to, the tradition of reason and justice, can count as that because it is responsive to one of the defining features of the, of the tradition, namely that it both opens itself to and provides the intellectual resources for a rigorous testing of the work for every judgment it holds out for acceptance as true. The tradition does not teach at all that the virtue of faith need be acquired or held by way of judgments made after consideration of evidence about the matters that have been indicated. On the contrary, true faith can be passed on and acquired by simple trust in persons and their simple profession of faith. But the tradition does teach that grace perfects, completes nature, and that the grace and virtue of faith can fittingly be the appropriate <coughs> extension into commitment and orientation of life, the appropriate extension of a judgment reached after deploying all the resources of natural, critical intelligence and reason, and made without me. Indeed, without, as the Americans say, stretch. The grievous rupture from the tradition that we call the Reformation had as one of its longer term consequences the emergence of a counter tradition, tradition developed as a response, in no way inevitable, to the long prepared but suddenly rapid advances of the natural sciences in the early 17th century. Philosophers like Hobbes, followed more or less closely by many successors, such as the mentioned only Anglophone ones, Locke, Hume, Bentham, drew from the new successors of the natural sciences a series of unsound conclusions about the nature and proper methods of practical reason, ethics, and political theory, and thus also about philosophy in general and legal theory in particular. By the 1950s, many philosophers were declaring or assuming that political philosophy and ethics are dead, are beyond philosophy, and incapable of getting beyond ideology or reportage of meanings. In partial resistance to this view, H.L.A. Hart set himself to revive the branch of political philosophy that we call legal theory, or jurisprudence, by tracking some of the self-understanding of a reasonable practical reason. 
But this human skepticism about ethics made mistake. Most of what he wrote about morality in his master book, The Concept of Law, and made, at best, radically incomplete his tracking of practical reason. His successor, Robert Walker, identified some of Hart's basic mistakes about social morality, as Hart himself in the end conceded, and went on to produce an account of legal reasoning in which both the appropriate significance of moral principles and the necessity for assessment of the legal system as a whole are affirmed with some justification and success. But Ronald Dawkins' own account of morality remained very undeveloped. And despite some enhancements in these last five years, deeply committed to a liberty of self-will which denied to law and government and their directors any proper and effective concern with truth about the human good. His vigorous defense of the notion of objective morality never engaged with substantive foundational issues, that is, with first principles of practical reason, their content as directing us to human goods, as intrinsic aspects of human flourishing, and their implications for principles of justice and right choice and action. Reflecting on the theoretical work of these two outstanding senior colleagues of mine, I have to conclude that it was constrained and undermined by mistaken denials built into the highly conventional tradition that I am calling the modern counter-tradition tradition. To these scholars, I believe, the main voices of the tradition remain distant and effectively silent, muffled, and queer, audible at all, presumed to be unsound. That distance or inaudibility has some causes in weaknesses, undeniable but I believe avoidable and surmountable, in the tradition's past responses to the counter tradition. Still, the deep and real grounds of my eminent colleague's resistance are surely the theses themselves. In the first instance, the theses of creation and freedom proves the challenges by their implications to grasp and affirm what Marx and Nietzsche to mention only two found intolerable, that we have a nature which is not self-made that we ought to advance beyond natural reason's findings to the reasonable submission of faith, the reasonable acceptance of the new information made available to all by a revelation which natural reason accurately deployed invites and even requires us to accept on the credible testimony of its witnesses in fulfillment of reason's own intimations and anticipations otherwise unfulfilled. Across my nearly half century as a university teacher, the counter traditions, political and <coughs> causes to which Hart and Walking gave their support have had advancing, partly gradual, partly accelerated success, not yet altogether complete, inter uninterrupted, but with bright prospects of success in the final stage legalized and subsidized euthanasia. Early in my teaching and learning years, I heard those notable Catholic philosophers, Elizabeth Anstel and Peter Keach, man and wife, discussing English society's advance towards that goal, euthanasia, and the prospect that only Catholic hospitals and institutions would remain as safe Papers. But the counter tradition, with its quasi philosophical but at bottom unphilosophical presuppositions, beliefs, and attitudes, has subsequently reached into institutions, even centers of the tradition. Safe havens have become hard to find and keep, retaining, reconstructing, and revivifying the judgments and institutions of the tradition in the face of the new emerging legal and cultural order will be a most demanding work, worthwhile work, for the clear-sighted 
deep thinking, faithful, wisely loving, and courageous. Is mi esperanza que ese será la obra de ustedes, lo que han de hacer y transmitir.